Hey art nerds, today is the third birthday of 7inch Kara's webcomic launch on 7inchkara.com and 7inchkara.tumblr.com and I wanted to celebrate with you guys with a little birthday illustration and kind of walk you guys through the process. So today we're going to be painting this illustration of Tanner giving Kara a big birthday present. The blue lines for this illustration were printed on Arches cold press watercolor paper using my Canon printer. I have tutorials on how to do that over on the blog. Penciled and then we're going to stretch it. So we have our penciled illustration here. We have some low tack blue painters tape. We have some plastic uh, gator board or coroplast. We have three and blue painters tape. We have Viva paper towels and then we have bulldog clips sides large or size four and binder clip size four and we also have a large hockey brush that we're going to be using for the stretching part of this tutorial you're also going to need a cup of clean water and i like to use a spray bottle of water as well so we begin with just our illustration on our coroplast I've turned my illustration over and I'm saturating the back first with a spray bottle and then I'm going to brush water on from the cup. I flip it over and then I spray it again. This activates the blue pigments, the blue dyes used by my printer and allows me to lift the majority of those up. This is my magic trick, my secret to watercolor illustration. So I lift that up using my paper towels and then I'm going to spray it again. And this is intended as the actual stretching wash. So we spritz it with water, then we wet it down with our hockey brush. And then we're gonna use the blue painter's tape to secure our watercolor paper to the board. I've tried a lot of different tapes over the years for my watercolor illustration. And I find the 3M crepe paper tape, uh, two inches or 1.5 inches works the best for what I do. Of course, this is a your mileage may vary sort of situation. So I start by stretching either the bottom of the, or the top, one of the short sides. Then I move on to stretching the two long sides. I apply the tape to my arm to remove some of the tack and I wet it because this increases the adhesion to our wet paper. Dry objects tend not to wanna stick to wet objects. Once I've got the bottom and two long sides secured, I'm going to tape the top. And the reason we do it this way is it really helps minimize the amount of buckling and cockling we're gonna see with our watercolor illustration. Ideally, I would have clips on all four sides holding it secure, but my gator board is cut to my average watercolor size, so I do have some overages. Next, I start by using ultramarine blue to paint in some of the shadows, the shadows underneath Kara and Tanner, and the shadows on their eyes. And for those of you who haven't read 7-inch Kara, I'd love to tell you guys a little bit about it since it is Kara's birthday. It's a really cute story about friendship and family. It centers around Lilliputian Kara, who's only 7 inches tall, as she sets out to explore and discover the world outside the shed her parents live in. Kara grew up in a forgotten, abandoned dollhouse hidden away in someone's back shed, and her world is really pretty small. It's mostly the dollhouse, the perimeter of the shed, and then a little bit of the yard around that. This shed is attached to a larger house that's been empty for about 10 years. So all of Kara's life, she has been told that humans are the stuff of legend, the stuff of myths. And the outside world is so large and Kara is so small and so sheltered that she'd never really had a lot of reason to doubt her parents. Her parents have also kept her kind of sequestered away from other Lilliputian kids. They don't really live near a community of Lilliputians. So Kara's worldview is pretty small. Eventually, she finds out from her mom that humans are indeed real, and she decides she wants to set out and meet one. And that's how she meets Naomi and her pet kitten, Pancake. Naomi is a teenage girl who's just moved into the house. She's moved away from New Orleans. She's had to leave all of her friends, and she's going through some pretty big changes in her life, too. So she has a lot to navigate. The first volume of 7-Inch Kara was first published in 2014. The first pages of 7-Inch Kara, so chapter one and chapter two were 
painted in 2012 when I was first learning how to watercolor. I didn't have a lot of experience, but I had a lot of passion and I had a lot to learn. And the process of painting hundreds of Kara pages has led me on this really exciting journey of watercolor. And I ended up falling in love with the medium. I've experimented with so many papers and paints and brushes trying to find the just right combination for my watercolor comic needs. And I feel like my pages now, because I'm actually up to chapter eight, and I just finished painting a bonus chapter. So we have nine chapters completed, but I feel like the progress I've shown in chapter eight and the bonus chapter are leagues away from where I started several years ago. So I feel like Seven Inch Kara really kind of encapsulates a lot of my artistic journey. It's not my first comic project. I've had several other comic projects, but it's the first that I've been willing to share online as a web comic. In the past, I've worked on several comics kind of privately. They were mostly for myself and for my own amusement or maybe the amusement of my friends. But with 7-Inch Kara, I really want to reach other people. I'm hugely inspired by Studio Ghibli works and what really inspires me the most is the feeling of hope, the feeling like you've been given a gift when you leave the movie, even the feeling of understanding, even lower key movies like When Marnie Was There, which is one of my favorites. Even though it's not a happy movie, you still leave feeling like you've been given something, even if it's just a fresh new way of looking at yourself or looking at the world. And that's what I want to do with 7-Inch Kara. I want my readers to feel like they've been given something, to feel like they have a new perspective on the world. And having Kara as a Lilliputian, having her family as tiny people, I want to use this as an opportunity to explore power dynamics, to explore consent, to explore just seeing the world from a new perspective and from a different point of view and learning to respect other people's differences and value those differences as part of what makes them who they are. And I hope with the whole story of Seven Inch Kara, not just volume one and not just volume two, but all four volumes, I'll be able to really explore that and learn something about myself. And maybe some of my readers will be able to learn something about themselves as well. Seven Inch Kara is an all ages comic, but I really aimed it at younger readers and I really wanted to create something that's not really there in the market. I wanted to make a comic that is softer and focuses more on conflict resolution and friendship and family dynamics and a comic that focuses on showing that a family can love one another and care about one another but often disagree and sometimes have trouble with respecting one another's viewpoints and respecting one another's boundaries and how that can be resolved. That's really important to me. I grew up in a family where that was not presented to me. That was not an option for me. My parents had a lot of trouble agreeing on things and working together and I wanted to use 7 Inch Kara as a way to show to kids who come from more troubled families, to people who came from more troubled backgrounds, that even though things aren't perfect, there can still be hope and we can still work towards a better future. So hopefully throughout all four volumes of 7-Inch Kara, I'm able to accomplish that. And working on Kara has been, in many ways, just such a joy. It's been a chance for me to explore my own issues, my own feelings. It's been a chance for me to touch on issues that I know friends are dealing with. It's been a chance for me to address things that I see my students struggling with. And hopefully I'm able to do this in a way that's not been done to death, in a way that isn't exactly the same as everyone else is doing it. So it's been an experience for me, a chance to learn and a chance to grow. And I hope to continue to do that in the next two volumes as well. Right now, I'm preparing to kickstart volume two of Seven Inch Kara. The first two chapters, chapter five and chapter six of volume two are available to read. You guys can go read them at seveninchkara.com or seveninchkara.tumblr.com. But chapter seven, chapter eight, the bonus chapter, a bunch of additional materials have never before been seen, have not been shared in webcomic form and are only going to be available in volume two until well after the Kickstarter. So if you enjoy Enjoy my work and if you want to support what I do please keep an eye out for the Kickstarter I know I'm gonna be talking about it a whole bunch here and over on the blog and over on Twitter and over on Instagram so hopefully you guys can't miss it and I can't wait to share some of the extra material that I've been preparing for 7 inch Kara volume 2 hope you guys are looking forward to it
So this illustration is one of kind of a matched set. Sorry about that. My mic popped out. It's one of a matched set of two um, featuring both Kara and Tanner. Tanner so far has only come up a little bit in volume one, but he's going to have a much bigger role in the upcoming volume three. And he's kind of Kara's only same age Lilliputian friend. She doesn't really know a lot of people. Her family lives pretty far away from the Lilliputian village. That's kind of nearby and Kara's never been allowed to just go and travel and just go and explore on her own until we hit volume one so Tanner is kind of her main friend her main source of companionship and she doesn't get to see him that often because he comes from a family of messenger Lilliputians and he's an apprentice messenger Lilliputian and he's learning his trade so he doesn't get to see her too often either. And if you guys are kind of interested in the world building of tiny people and Lilliputians I have three volumes of my used to be called Inktober but we're going to refer to it as Incredible October three volumes of my Inktober zine Lilliputian Living. The first one explores Lilliputian careers and trades. The second one explores Lilliputian families and holidays and the different types of Lilliputians. And then the third one is more like a Lilliputian herbal where we explore different plants that are used in just daily Lilliputian life. So you can kind of learn more about the whole world building through Lilliputian living. I only touch on these things a little bit in 7-inch Kara because my goal isn't to make this massive sprawling fantasy epic that people just get lost in. I just wanted to tell a story that people could escape into for a little while and then dive back out. So there are supplemental materials available like Lilliputian Living Volumes 1 through 3 and those are also going to be available in the Volume 2 Kickstarter. So for this illustration, generally I don't use a lot of bright colors with Kara because it's important to me that she be able to hide in the grass and just kind of blend in with nature. Just sort of her daily wear is a bit camouflagey. It doesn't attract a lot of attention. And also she doesn't wear a lot of synthetic dyes or even modern clothing. A lot of the fabric that comes from that Kara's family uses since her mother is a seamstress either is scavenged or is traded for with merchants or um, her mother has woven herself. So a lot of natural dyes or more faded fabrics, secondhand fabrics are used. But since it's her birthday, I wanted to create an outfit that was really cute and vibrant and fun. And I think since Kara's access and experience with these sort of bright colors would be limited, I thought it would be fun to dress her in something that's fun and cute and vibrant because I think she'd really enjoy that. And that's something that actually comes up in Chapter 7 of 7-inch Seven Kara. So hopefully you guys will look forward to her experiences with bright, fun clothing. So I have a lot of watercolor tutorials here on this channel, somewhere around a hundred, maybe more, and a lot more watercolor tutorials over in the watercolor basics section at natosoup.blogspot.com. So I highly recommend you guys check those out if you're looking to kind of learn the basics of watercolor. But generally when I'm painting an illustration like this, I usually start by kind of blocking things in and kind of figuring out what color palette I want to use. Color theory, color usage, color language is not my strongest point. It's something I have to really work on and try to focus on. So um, often when I'm recording for you guys, the recording aspect is a bit of a a distraction for me. And it kind of keeps my brain from focusing on some of the more finer points, the more fiddly points of painting like color theory and composition. So for this, um, I went with Tanner's usual messenger Lilliputian outfit. So it's just a series of greens and browns. That's pretty standard. And for Kara, I went with high vibrancy. Now I wanted the bow in her hair to match the bow on the present. I don't know. I just thought that would be kind of a cute touch. This giant bow in her hair and this giant bow on the present. And since it's her birthday, I wanted to go with really fun birthday colors. So I went with a synthetic blue, a hot pink, and then a really vibrant purple. And I tried to mirror that in the outfit she's wearing as well. 
for this painting in general, as you saw, we started with the shadows and then I filled in their skin tones. And for lighter skin tones, it's pretty easy because you're really using a lot of the white of the page as your highlights. For darker skin tones, I've talked about those in other tutorials, and I really like to start by painting my blushes and my shadow colors in first, then layering on top of that. So for lighter skin tones, my process is pretty simple. It's the skin tone, then the blush color, then maybe additional skin tone as the color evaporates or as I mix it more concentrated. Then I mix a red violet together for the shadow on the skin. And then I might put in something like freckles or if they have like a tattoo or if they have um, just any sort of anything going on on the skin, any sort of pattern on the skin would usually be done last after I've applied the shadows. And the rationale for that is with watercolor, like with oil, you want to go fat over lean. You want to do your more saturated mixes on top of your really light glazes of watercolor. You don't want to try, you don't want to like paint this really beautiful detailed tattoo and then try to glaze a shadow on top of it only to have all of the colors that you'd put down in the tattoo run because they were reactivated. So one of the plus sides of painting on cotton rag paper is your watercolors, especially if you do a million layers like I do, they're much less likely to reactivate, to turn muddy and to lift up because they get sucked down into the cotton rag fibers. If you're painting on a cellulose paper like Handsome on Vol, which is what I paint the majority of my seven inch Kara comic pages on, it's more, you have to be more careful. You have to be more judicious in how you do glazes and how thick your glazes are, what brushes you use for glazes um, and how you generally apply shadow color or accent color. So when I'm painting on like Canton Montfau, like with Kara, I will, it, it handles more like a cotton rag paper than a lot of the cellulose papers. It's more like a cotton rag. It's a very even tempered cellulose paper. So it's more like a cotton rag than like Strathmore's cellulose papers or Canton XL watercolor paper. But I do have to kind of limit my layers and try to mix my saturations a little stronger because I'm not going to get as many layers in there. And I also generally rely a bit more on watercolor pencils to kind of help me adjust my palette and to add shadows after the fact. So for this illustration, I'm mostly painting with very soft brushes, a lot of synthetics. So I have the silver black velvet brushes. These are a mix of synthetic and natural hair fibers. I really like these brushes. They're very, very soft though. And on temperamental cotton rag papers that have a lot of tooth or are prone to buckling, you may find these to be harder to control than say synthetic brushes or really stiff natural hair brushes. I'm also using a really, really soft square hair brush. This can be useful for filling in large areas of color because it can hold a lot of water, but the fibers are very soft. So it's also useful for adding glazes on top of areas you may have already painted or kind of adjusting the color because since the fibers are so soft, it's way less likely to kind of scrape up the pigments from prior layers. A little bit later on, I'm going to use a few Kalinske Sable brushes. Like I have one here where I'm adding in kind of the finer details on Tanner's outfit. Kalinske Sable is um, a very stiff for watercolor, has a lot of snap, very sturdy. It's one of my favorite brushes to paint with, especially when I want to focus on mark making or if I'm trying to pull really fine details. It tends to be more pricey and um, if you have pets, they may ruin your brushes. So it's definitely an investment that I can't recommend for every watercolor artist. And I certainly wouldn't recommend 
someone who's new to water spend as much money as it takes to buy Kalinsky Sable brushes. So now I'm kind of working on the surface design for Kara's dress and the colors were very 80s-tastic. So I decided to reference some popular 80s surface design patterns and kind of invent my own inspired by those. So I'm painting this design on top of her dress. So I've already painted most of the layers of her dress. The shadows have already been painted. The depth of color has already been painted. The form has already been determined. And I'm applying my surface design on top of that. And when you're painting surface design, when you're painting patterns on fabric, you want to keep in mind kind of the way the fabric is moving. So the dress Kara's wearing is very simple. It's basically like a little overall dress. It has a bead at the front and then it ties around the back. So it's a very, very simple dress. And the fabric, I imagine, would be kind of stiff. So that makes doing the surface design on this dress really easy because we're basically just following the shape of a cone around. So now I'm using the Kalinsky Sable brush to kind of paint in uh, the last final details on the hair, kind of tighten up the faces to paint in the eyelids and the eyebrows, things like that. And I do apologize that my head's getting in the shot. Those of you who watch my other watercolor videos know this happens all the time. So I'm not even going to go into detail. So I've switched over now to watercolor pencils. And my two favorite watercolor pencils are Derwent Inktense and Supercolor 2. And I have a bunch of watercolor pencil reviews coming up. You guys will see why in the near future, why I love these over some of the other watercolor pencils on the market. Now I haven't tried every single watercolor pencil out there. I've heard and seen good things about Karen Dosh's Museum Lockrell, I want to say watercolor pencils, but they're five bucks a pop. It's a little bit cost prohibitive to me. So for the price point, I'm comfortable with painting, uh, paying. Karen Dosh's Supercolor 2 and Derwent Inktense are great watercolor or ink pencils since the ink tents are technically not watercolor. They're India ink based and they are indelible once they've dried. So I use the watercolor pencils, like I use the indigo to add shadows to Kara's dress, shadows to the bow in her hair, a little bit of skin shadow here and there, and some shadows to Tanner's outfit. But I'm mostly using the white watercolor pencil to pull in white highlights and white details to lighten some things up. So if you're doing surface design, if you're adding patterns to clothing or textures to clothing, watercolor pencils can be a great way to do that. You can blend them out if the design becomes too harsh, or you can leave them as is. They're really a flexible medium that can add a lot to your watercolor illustration. So now that this piece is done, it's just time to remove the blue painter's tape. I wait until everything is dry and then I remove the tape at a 90 degree angle. I am... Um I had some purple splatters on this piece. Now I could have leaned in and just really splattered the purple around, masking Kara and Tanner off, but I decided to just correct them. So sometimes the blue painter's tape, will, you'll get little bitty pieces that are stuck into it. You can just use a masking fluid pickup to kind of scrub that out. So that is Kara's birthday watercolor illustration. I hope you guys will help me celebrate Kara's birthday. If you haven't read it yet, head on over to 7inchkara.com or 7inchkara.tumblr.com and you can read the first six chapters for free. It would really mean a lot to me if you guys checked it out. I'd love to hear what you think of it. Or you can order the first volume of 7 Inch Kara from the Natto Shop at nattosoup.com slash shop. I believe I'll have a link down in the description below. I'll have links to everything you guys need, including other tutorials down in the description below. 
I'd also love it if you like 7-Inch Kara, if you like my art and you want to keep up with it. If you signed up for the Kickstarter mailing list, I have all kinds of never-before-seen behind-the-scenes goodies planned for folks who sign up for the mailing list. You guys can find a link to that down in the description below as well. So happy third birthday, Kara. It's been an interesting three years, and having a webcomic has definitely been a learning experience for me. I hope you guys will look forward to what I have coming up in the future. Bye guys!